Let us begin with prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight. You are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Some of the sermons in the book of Acts have a disheartening effect on preachers. Sometimes we occasionally sink so low as to ask ourselves whether anyone is listening. For example, after Peter's sermon at Pentecost, 3,000 people joined the church. And guess what? After his next sermon, speaking of Peter, not Paul, there were 5,000 converts to Jesus. So I think you can understand that we might become a little disheartened sometimes. The numbers are astonishing to everyone, and they are risky to preacher self-esteem. But the sermon that we heard in Scripture this morning gives us preachers a little relief. Paul's reception in Athens, in the center of academic life for the entire world at the time, was just lukewarm. In fact, most of Paul's hearers ridiculed him, and most of you have not done that to me. Not yet. Most of you. Some offered to listen to him again if he was ever back in town. But only a few responded, though his sermon seemed like such a good one. I've always adored the way the names of those who responded to his sermon were written down by the writer of the Acts of the Apostles and are there for all eternity, for everyone to read, Dionysius and Damaris. When Paul began, he complimented his listeners. He tried not to be offensive. He established his main point, the oneness of God. And he carefully explained God's greatness in terms with which his hearers could relate. He even flattered them by quoting one of their own poets. And best of all, he kept his remarks brief. Amen. <laughs> Paul did not speak with the same tone and attitude to every group he addressed. He understood that some people know God and some do not, and he did not mince words with some of his listeners the way that he more delicately speaks in Acts 17. God is very near to all seekers, he softly claims. Who are these people that Paul would speak to them so sympathetically? As Paul traveled about the Mediterranean, he would naturally pass through the major center of ancient learning that was Athens. And in Athens in 50 CE Christian era, ideas were in the driver's seat. Thoughtful people speculated endlessly on philosophical wisdom, they debated logic and ethics, and they wrote poetry and plays that reveal profound human experience and insight. And on the great hill of the Areopagus that was the epicenter of learning and debate, Paul flattered his listeners on how spiritual the evidence of all the statues and carvings showed them to be, how hungry he knew that they were about spiritual truths. A university town like ours, Conway, is always focused on talk about theories and concepts with just a smidgen of sports chatter mixed in. Athens was a university city and it was filled with sophisticated intellectuals. Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are. Personally, I think that Paul was just a bit insincere in his flattery of them by saying that. 
but he needs to command their impulse to worship something beyond themselves, something beyond creation. We Reformed Christians strongly believe that God cannot be understood without God's self-revelation. We believe that we can even read the Bible and not know God unless God chooses to be revealed. Paul flattered the way the Athenians showed desire to find God by covering all their bases and offering statuary even with such inscriptions as to an unknown God. And then he goes on. The God you worship but do not know, this is who I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, this God cannot be captured in shrines made by human hands, but is over the whole earth. This God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. That little phrase, live, in whom we live and move and have our being, is very different from Paul's theology in some other passages. It's very ethereal, very erudite. This God calls us all to repent. For this God has established a moment of judgment to be presided over by the one Christ whom this God raised from death. In multicultural, pluralistic societies like ancient Athens, people were open to considering many ideas. The Athenians were high on the religious tolerance scale, but they were slow to make decisions, slow to embrace one religion, religion skeptical about following just one belief system, just one leader, just one teacher. I think they were wise about that, don't you? But they were also slow to believe that one God was so superior to others as to be able to raise anyone from the dead. And that is unfortunate for them. That point was where Paul's sermon got shot down by the Athenians, don't you see? That point, that proclamation of the resurrection had, well, it had actually caused riots in other cities. I have yet to cause a riot in any city in which I have preached. But we should all remember that words causing riots are sometimes trustworthy words. In our day, religious tolerance is important for reasons that are not the focus of our worship today. But the word tolerance often connotes a very grudging acceptance of something that we just can't counter. Tolerance sometimes does not connote genuine acceptance. On the other hand, I still hear people say very blithely, all religions are the same. Well, they aren't. And though the intentions may be magnanimous, all religion cannot be reduced to the aphorism, we're all just trying to get to the same place. You hear this, I hear it. And it's a total cop-out. Modern times are closely related to ancient times, though we easily lose sight of the fact because life in the digital age just is so frantic, it goes fast. But our lives are much like the people of those who lived during the period of which we're speaking today. Enormous relationship challenges, self-doubts, and all kinds of mental and physical illnesses abounded. And then there's this this fact of our current existence. There are more than 1,600 distinct religions in the United States which have 2,000 adherents or more. 1,600 religions in the U.S. today with 2,000 or more believers. The early Christians now lived in a religiously pluralistic world, and so do we. One thing or another thing that has not changed is that God still expresses love and care and guidance 
through specific individuals whose words and actions are inspired by God. These little children that we come close to worshiping when they come to the front of our church every Sunday, they do not know who God is unless somebody tells them. They don't know it automatically. They know that there is a God and they would inscribe inscriptions to an unknown God if they got to be adults. Someone has to teach them, a mother or a father or a devoted adult who is not related. And sometimes there's a wonderful collaboration, such as we will celebrate next Sunday when we celebrate the ministry of Sunday school teachers. But because God wants to know us and wants to be better known all the time, our knowledge of God doesn't cease to grow when we get out of braces or get into the driver's seat of the car for the first time. And just so, God still speaks to people who are searching for God through such oddball ga gatherings as this one. God still speaks. Last week, we read about the witness of Stephen, who was the first named martyr, the first witness to faith in Christ by dying because of his belief. That's the definition of a martyr. Some of you may not know that Paul started his young adult life as a terrible persecutor of those who practiced a religion different from his own. And for the rest of his life, after he met Jesus Christ, he was grieved by his cruelty to Christians. In the story of Stephen's death, there is a notable detail at the very end. The narrator said that the onlookers laid their coats down for the stoning at the feet of a young man named Saul who approved their killing of Stephen. Now much has transpired in scripture between that reading and today's reading, including Saul's meeting and being blinded by a great light and hearing Jesus' voice in the middle of the road when he was en route to more persecutions. Others with Paul heard the voice but didn't see the blinding light. He was taken then to Damascus and he began instruction under a man named Ananias, not the same as another Ananias that's named in scripture. And Ananias was actually afraid to teach Saul because of Saul's fearsome reputation. But slowly Saul began his new life in Christ and he was baptized. And he began to preach and teach in the Damascus synagogues to show that Jesus was the Messiah. It was shocking to many. It was shocking because of his former life as an effective inquisitor. When Paul visited Athens for the first time, he couldn't believe how crowded the public places were with what he termed idols. If we go anywhere in our country or world today, there are still many idols, even if they don't have inscriptions that are religious. Then they were carved representations and inscriptions of human homage to multiple gods with a lowercase, lowercase g. Today, God still knows there are people like the Athenians who are searching to know God. With the inspiration of Paul's gracious, encouraging, clear, emphatic, truth-filled words in Athens a long, long time ago, we today must share the gift of making known what others proclaim as unknown. We today must urge spiritual seekers to embrace the faith-filled way of Jesus Christ despite what occurred in the past leaving the old behind and receiving new life today with the promise of resurrection life. The goodness of God's call to believe in the saving love of Jesus Christ was and is validated by God's raising Jesus from the dead. We who worship many gods 
are promised eternal life in the revelation by word and deed and sacrament sharing of the life of our one Savior, Jesus Christ, who is Lord and Judge of all. Glory to God forever. Amen.